enjoyable lunch. Um, had some good conversations around uh, the topics that we've been talking about so far um, and how you're going to take the things that you've taken from the <coughs> um, and put them into action in your own lives after today. Um, about two years ago, a couple of my staff members came back from conferences uh, at the Council for Opportunity and Education, which is like a national organization that uh, helps out with providing professional development for Creole um, workers. And uh, they said, we saw this speaker, he was so awesome, we have to get him to come to the event. And uh, so I looked into it a little bit, watched a, little, a few video clips, um, you know, read some of the, the blurbs online, and I agreed. Uh, this was an awesome speaker, we had to have him come to the event. And last year, we brought him in. And uh, unfortunately for us, we did a bad job of advertising for the event. What, what came out of that was something pretty cool. Um, our keynote today was able to have a very intimate talk uh, with a group that was about maybe a third, uh, maybe about uh, half the size of this group in here. Um, and those words obviously get some inspiration around our uh, session earlier today. And so we are very happy to have Mr. Richard Taylor back with us again for Trio Days this year. Please welcome Richard Taylor. Be creative in sharing your stories. But a big part of that 
is having an understanding for your obstacles in order to overcome it. Many times we just go through life and sometimes we go through, the, go through the motions. So I got three books out. My second book is called Between the Dream. People ask me all the time what Between the Dream is. They see this maze on the front of the cover of the book and I explain to them Between the Dream is the point between your present moment and your promise, which is your process. Between the dream is the process. When you embrace your process, you embrace your progress. And when you embrace your progress, you can walk into every promise, purpose, and plan with your life. Many times, we don't embrace the process so because it's hard. We don't embrace the process of telling our truth because we're afraid of what the end result might look like. What if they don't take to me well? Or like our friend Ebony, what if, what if I lose my thug? <laughs> Whatever it might be, the reality is that we've got to start getting to a space where we embrace every part of our process. And in order to do that, we've got to be able to under understand our obstacles so that we can overcome them. When you look at the likes of Viola Davis, who just so happens to be a trio alumni, right? Individuals like her, John Kinsey on this, did I say his last name right? The, the What Would You Do guy, if you've ever seen the show? He's a trio alum. He comes and does a lot of the uh, MCing for events for COE. But when you look at these individuals who are now mainstream on the big screen, they had so many hurdles and obstacles to overcome that look really similar to yours as it related to being a first gen student, as it related to being a student with a disability, better, maybe a student that comes from a low income background. I know we had a conversation last year when I was here about how some of the students in this area specifically, don't necessarily understand what TRIO is about because they come from privilege. Maybe their, their, their understanding is different because of the lifestyle that they've got the chance to live. But with that being the case, just because you seem like an underdog to other people doesn't mean that you have to be one. It doesn't mean that you're closed in and that you remain this person who sits in a space of nothingness and does average work or minor work for the rest of your life don't have to. And that's why I'm here today. You look at me, Richard Taylor, I travel the world speaking. I'm 28. I'm an SSS alum. What got me in the space that I'm in now? I have three books, three best-selling books, no publisher, sold, sold over 20,000 copies in a span of four years. I failed reading and I failed writing. High school, college. I was an underdog as a first gen and low income student. But then there was the interpersonal side as well. Going back to sixth grade, 10 years old. Look, how I many of you know, I know y'all remember Pokemon, because you got people playing Pokemon, go now, and walking into oceans and traffic and doing all this <laughs> silly stuff, right? Just, whoop. But before Pokemon Go, we had the Pokemon cards, which is still out, right? Pokemon was a big thing back in sixth grade. Right? So I transferred to this public school. It was my first public school in Chicago. Coming from a Christian school, I didn't know how brutal kids were going to be. I'm like, okay, whatever. I go, I'm this short, fat, pudgy kid, right? They called me Doughboy. They used to pick on me. You can laugh, it's okay. It's fine. My feelings won't be hurt anymore, I promise. Okay. Um, and during this time, I didn't realize that I was getting ready to walk into situations that would then turn into obstacles and obstacles that would then shift the entire course of my life. So one day I'm in the bathroom, I just got through beating up these kids in a Pokemon game. I took all their cards, put it in my nice little notebook, collected me some new Pokemon, got to catch them all. That was it, <laughs> right? <laughs> Going to the bathroom, get ready to leave out. How many of you all play football, have watched football? Anybody? There's a drill that coaches do during football practice sometimes called the bull ring. And with the bull ring, for those of you all who don't know what it is, it's a drill that's supposed to bring about awareness for the players. So what the coach does is they put one person in the middle, and then they put the rest of the players around the, uh, the player in the middle. The coach will call out a last name, they'll call out a number, and from that, somebody has to shoot out to the person in the middle. And that person in the middle is supposed to be able to turn around and practice their awareness skills to know when an attack is coming at any given point in time. I got put into a bull ring in sixth grade in the bathroom with no coaches and nobody calling a name or a number. One person runs up from behind me, punches me in the back of the head. Another person comes up, kicks me next thing you know, I'm 
down on the ground getting jumped by 10 kids. I look up at the ring leader and I ask him, why are you doing this? Because you don't like you, because you're fat, and people like you don't know how to defend themselves. So we do with you as we please. That day I went home and I'm upset, but I'm not upset with them. I'm upset with the Ebony did a great job talking about learning to hate yourself. And I, I went home that day mad at me, hating me, because of how I looked physically. Not realizing that this was literally just a, a phase that myself, my brothers, my cousins, we went through from the age of 10 to 12 before we shot up in size, right? So I go home that day. And I'm mad at myself, and I say, well, maybe if I cut some of the fat off of my body, they would like me more. So I walk into the kitchen, I grab a butter knife, and I literally try and cut incisions thinking that I'm going to be able to cut fat off. I'm 10, guys. I didn't know any better. Look, we all have those wild imaginations when we're young, right? But what I didn't realize is that during that time, those actions would lead to self-mutilation. So as I got older, the next year, the next two years, it became a, a, a thing for me where I'm trying to even out my mental and emotional pain and baggage by inflicting physical pain. So cutting ensues. After that, talking about high school, every breakup, every time I didn't do well in a class, every time I felt like a failure, every time I felt like I shouldn't be here, I got to the space where there were full-blown attempted suicides. And it was no longer just a knife. It was pills, homemade nooses, things that I would have never expected. Now this is the inside. On the outside, Richard Taylor is a standout athlete, quarterback with multiple scholarships around the country. I'm a playboy. Well, it was a playboy, not anymore. I say it, no, I'm playing. Listen, no, but no, <laughs> no, but seriously, like, I, I went on this path of trying to be the man, right? Because these are the images and these are the messages that they give off so many times, right? And I'm doing all of the things that everybody says I should do, but not paying attention to me as to what I need to do. So, by the time I got to college, I found out that I had an enlarged heart. I had to drop my scholarship. For me, football was the only way that I would make it through. Granted, I had good grades. I was never a good test taker, though. My ACT, 17, 16, 15, in that order. So I never felt like I could literally, like, legitimately test into anything. And I'm like, well, I got to rely on my athletics. I lost the scholarship in 2006, my freshman year. And after losing the scholarship, everything started to plummet. The issues that I thought I had let go a long time ago, the things that I thought were done, depression, I hadn't felt sad in a while, and everything just crept back in. And in that space, I realized it never left. I invited a lot of the wrong things into my life, got into a relationship off the wrong motives, and I ended up being a victim of domestic abuse for a year and a half taking it. But during that same time frame, I gained 170 pounds. So I went from 200 pounds to 370. And now my health is bad. I stopped caring about going to class. I had a 1.4 GPA my first semester. My second semester I had a 1.6. And my third semester I had a 1.7. By the time I got to the third semester, I was on academic probation. They were ready to kick me out of school. So in my mind, I'm in a space where I hate class, I'm mad at my parents because I don't want to be at this college anymore. There are so many things going on that I can't explain. And what did I do? I tried my best to use facades, masks, and cover-ups so nobody could see the pain that I was going through. What did this look like? I became the president of a Christian fraternity. I was one of the leaders of the gospel choir. I was one of the heads of residence hall association. I did work for student government. I used titles and work to try and overcompensate for everything else that I was lacking internally. Because I felt like if people really knew who I was, they would see the failure standing in front of their face. 
Finally, I found out on Dr. King's birthday of 2008 that the young lady that I was with at the time, she was cheating on me and I was crushed because I had no identity. I had given everything I had to her. And in that space, I finally made the decision where if you don't care about me, then I don't care about you. And I walked down to my room, we stayed on the same dorm, in the same dorm hall and on the same floor. I took a 12 inch blade, some of the one that Michael Myers had, and I went down my wrist five times. Got my tattoo that says love there now. But you can still, it's love between my scars. And in that, put me in the hospital for a week and a half. Most colleges have what's called the police beat inside of the school newspaper. And this basically lets you know what took place on campus throughout the weekend or every evening, important stuff. All I see is Richard Taylor's two leader suicide. Now in this, I'm like, there's no way I'm going back to the school once I get out of this hospital. I'm already getting ready to get kicked out because of my grades. What's the purpose of going back? So I can be embarrassed even more by people that I've had to talk to, people that believed in me, people that saw the mask and the lie that I was trying to live, and now I've got to go back to this. I ended up getting a call from a gentleman by the name of Quincy Payton. Quincy was at the time an academic advisor for the SSS program at Northern Illinois University, which is the college I was at. He calls me, he's like, Richard, I know I don't know you, this is gonna seem really weird. He was like, but you made a mistake and it does not have to be the end of your life, I wanna help you. I'm like, what? How, you don't know me. He was like, I don't need to know you in order to know that there's greatness inside. So that one call, I finally decided to give him a chance. Went into his office, we met, he had a peer mentoring class. I took the class. After I took the class, Quincy said, hey, you should really consider joining SSS. So that's what I did. A lot of sleepless nights, a lot of tired, like, I mean, when I, I look like a zombie going to class all of 2008. But I put so much time and effort, and they invested so much into me between tutors and friends and counseling just to really show me that TRIO works. By the time the semester was over, I had a 4.0 on that semester, which was enough to pull me off of academic probation, which, by the way, if you all do not know already, it is much easier to lose it than it is to gain it. So please, why is your academics important? because it's a tough uphill battle. Give yourself an opportunity to have an even playing field. Now I stand here before you today, right? Cool, Richard, that was great. But what does this mean for you? I tell you this for several reasons. First and foremost, because a lot of times, talking about some of the issues that I've dealt with are very taboo in a lot of communities as a whole. With that being the case, telling stories in general and telling our truth in order to help other people, we can be hindered many times because of the fact that we might feel like it's not adequate enough. Maybe you feel like you are just too much of a, a wreck and you've got so many layers to peel back through that this couldn't help anybody. They're going to look at you like a basket case. Some of you all feel like, well, you know what? My life hasn't been that bad. But there are people that can still learn from you. You said it, seven billion people in this world, somebody can learn from you. Somebody has walked the walk that you have. Somebody has gone through the same struggle that you have. And they can learn from you. When it comes to facing obstacles, some of the biggest things that we have to understand in obstacles is where we lie within all of the, the obstacles that we face. Many times what we don't realize is that facing an obstacle really is just a situation and it's temporary. But when we face obstacles, we don't realize that you have the situation and then you have self. One of the things that I love about the trio stories is that you all finally get to a space where you understand self in every situation. It doesn't mean that you're gonna be perfect, but you've literally practiced excellence enough to start having a better perspective on life to do things differently even in hellacious situations. It's important to get a chance to know you because the biggest obstacle that you will face when it comes to 
overcoming, to create this story, to become this person that you will be, to do everything that you're going to do. The biggest obstacle you will face is you. Many times we don't realize that we give so much power over to obstacles. We give so much power over to situations because of how it looks via a bark. We haven't tested the bite of it, but our problems sound good. They sound bad. And because of that, we don't always test it out to really see just how many and greedy it can be. And in that, we don't give ourselves the fighting chance to step up and show ourselves to be strong. Perfect example. How many of you all have been paying attention to the political climate of our country? Hatred, xenophobia, people are scared, it's a lot of confusion, it's a lot of back and forthness. And I see a lot of people on social media every day complaining about how things have basically scoped out up until this point. I can't believe we let this happen. Oh, life is over. We might as well get ready to go move to Mexico, or we might as well go over to the UK and start a new life. Oh, Canada's border isn't too far. Let's go to Canada. And the reality is, is that we don't realize that in spaces like that, just because of this situation, when it comes to what we're seeing in the world, it doesn't mean that we run. Specifically when it comes to TRIO. TRIO is a part of the Department of Education. That's even both. <laughs> just get brought into office for the Department of Education. Listen, all right, we don't have a conversation real quick. <laughs> you can do anything you want to, okay? We had an actor become president literally a few months ago. We had somebody who's never stepped foot inside a public school up until a few weeks ago become the, head, the secretary, like the head of the, the uh, of education. Now, if you want to be a unicorn in 2017, be a unicorn. <laughs> Sometimes we feel like throwing in the towel. Sometimes we don't want to do it. You all told some amazing stories today. You all shared some great things today. And at times, I heard the crackling in your voice, uh, the point where I could just see it visually where you wanted to give up, where you wanted to let go. And it reminded me of the story that I heard a few weeks ago from a, a pastor that I got a chance to hear at conference. And he talked about this guy who um, was... Uh, he was overseas in the war. It was two, two veterans. They were overseas. They were in the war. This was before they became vets. 
and one of them was inside of a bunker. Both of them were trying to get into enemy territory. One guy was inside the bunker, and he saw his partner getting ready to run into enemy's camp, but he didn't know it. So him being the good person that he is, he steps out of the bunker, shouts his name, gets his attention, but he gets shot and killed in the process. He saves his life, though. Years later, they have a memorial for all of the veterans who have passed away in the line of duty. The gentleman whose life was saved, he saw the wife and the son of the man who saved his life. He ended up walking up to him. And he looked at the little boy and he said, you will not believe how incredible your father is. He saved my life. And the little boy looked back up at him and he said, was it worth it? Before we take the look, come on. For me, I didn't think about that. Well, look, when I was getting ready to end it all on several occasions, I didn't think was it worth it when my dad was working three jobs, literally trying to provide for three sons and a wife. I didn't think about my mom and every pay cut. Dana Griffin gave a great story about her mother this morning. I didn't think about was that sacrifice worth me making this decision to quit and give up right now? And this is the question that I'm asking each and every one of you. Is it worth it? In my second book, I talk about how physical suicide is not the only form of suicide. And the chapter is called The New Suicide, right? I talk about how a lot of times we can attempt and commit suicide on our dreams, on our goals, everything that doesn't have to do with us physically, our mental, our emotional. The moment we give up, we cut the cord, we have literally died in that moment to whatever it is we were trying to do. And what I'm saying is this, before you attempt a new suicide, before you decide to quit and give it up, just because life isn't going your way right now, just because your trio story is still being made, just because you are in the process right now of being reconstructed into who you are supposed to be, do you give up? Was the sacrifice for everybody who would look, who did whatever they needed to do to get you to this point right now, was their sacrifice worth it? Ever right? She was right. You know, we tend to hate our parents until we get older and we become parents, or we start to see what our parents are talking about in certain spaces. And now I look at it and I'm like, I understand. Look, for me, had I let go. Had this attempt worked, it wouldn't have been worth it. Had this attempt worked, we wouldn't have talked last year. And if we hadn't talked, this wouldn't be happening right now. We've got to start thinking future forward, not just for ourselves. Guys, a lot of times the struggles that we go through individually as people and then collectively as a community, it's not for us. It's for those around us. It's for those coming up after us. It's for those who will feel like they can't go any further and feel like they can't make it as, as time goes on. So today I ask you, was the sacrifice that people made worth it? As we get ready to go into a space where they are talking about cutting funding and then eventually trying to cut the full department, which would mean cutting this, God forbid a trio was to get cut. That does not mean the lifeline stops. Because trio isn't just the name of an organization. Upward Bound, SSS, ETS, UV Veterans, come on, McNair Scotland, every, every facet. It's not just the title. That name lives with inside of us. Why? Because trio is nothing but great people with great stories who have a hell of a life and they have to go through a lot of things to become great. Trio works because you work. Trio works because you've surrendered enough of yourself and relinquished enough of your power over to nonsense, and now you are ready to fully give into something that can not only benefit you, but place you exactly where you need to be in the future. So yes, we will have obstacles. Yes, we will find ourselves in places where we don't know what we're doing at times, and all we can do is trust the process. Sometimes you will feel like you want to give up, and that's okay. However, 
Just because you have the feeling doesn't mean that you give into it. In those moments, you've got to start to think about what the sacrifices were that were made for you and what sacrifices you need to make so that you can be a helping hand to somebody else. Trio does work, and it works because of you. For those of you all who haven't yet shared your story, I encourage you, start taking the time to look deeper into what you've overcome and start taking the time to truly invest into you. Not from a, spoil, a point of, of being selfish and loving me, me, me um, in a way that, that blocks everybody else out. When I say loving you, I mean legitimate self-love and self-investment. The decision that I make today, is this going to be something that's going to be good for me? Is this beneficial for my life, for my future, and for everything that I represent? That's the real self-love. Making the decisions that will count for your life, that will give you longevity in everything you do. Guys, you are not losing in life. You are not failing. You are simply between the dream. Once again, what is between the dream? The point between your present moment and your promise is your process. Between the dream is the process. When you embrace your process, you embrace your progress. And when you embrace your progress, you can walk into every promise, purpose, and plan for your life. Thank you so much for your time. I love you all.